Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. This is a very important topic and a very important person. And uh, we're going to start with a person and get on to the topic, but first we'll start with a person. So I want to first of all introduce Dr. Schrager. Dr. Lewis Schrager is a graduate of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, and the Vanderbilt School of Medicine in Nashville, Tennessee. Correct me if I miss anything, okay? He trained in internal medicine at the University Hospital at the Bellevue Medical Center in New York City from 1981 to 1984. and received his training in infectious diseases at the Harvard School of Medicine, combined infectious disease program, Boston, Massachusetts, and at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Montefiore Medical Center in Bronx, New York. He has served as chief of the epidemiologist Epidemiology Branch, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases of the NIH, and as a Chief of Clinical Review in the Office of Vaccine Research and Review at the Center for Biologics, Evaluation and Research of the United States Food and Drug Administration. I also learned that uh, Dr. Lewis is actually an avid photographer and likes to take uh, lots of great pictures, especially of Briss's, and also as a playwright. So quite a, colorful, uh, quite a colorful resume there for many, many things. Um, okay. Um, I just, just one little piece of uh, here. Okay. All right. So now um, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but I want to start, um, Dr. Schrager, or should I call you Lewis? Lewis. First, I want to talk to you about how I met you. Can I talk about that? Please. We have a very close friend called Rachel Miller, who lived here for several years and married Zalman Miller. And uh, Zalman Miller is your first cousin. And they live in New Jersey and we've been very close since then. And Zalman interviewed you. And I was listening to the interview uh, last week and I was so enthralled by it. And I was so happy to get some straight information. So much stuff out there that you hear that I really thought this would be great to have you come on and share with us your knowledge and your information. So tell me, first of all, about your growing up. Uh, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Yeah, actually, I'm going to one step back and thank you and thank Zalman and Rachel and, you know, for, uh, for, inv for first to Zalman for inviting me to address his community in, in New Jersey. And, uh, uh, you know, we've been talking about this for a while. And there's a lot of confusion and then, uh, you know, miscommunication, et cetera. And, you know, I told him I, I would answer the questions I can answer, and if I can't answer them, I won't. And and I said the same thing to you. So I, I do appreciate you and your community reaching out and um, you know trying to get to get answers uh, for for some of these uh, issues that are out there. Um, for me, I grew up well. You know, I, I grew up in a town called Westfield, New Jersey. Um, uh, you know, we we were probably the only the only family who kept kosher in the entire town, mm. uh, which was sort of an interesting experience. Um, as I mentioned to you, my my Jewish credentials. Is, I went a couple. I, I went to public school, but for a couple of years, I I did go to uh, the Elizabeth uh, Talmud Torah run uh, run by Rabbi Tights. Uh, I remember him very fondly. Um, very famous, very famous rabbi, previous generation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, I ended up going to, to Hopkins and had a lot of a lot of interests there. Um, what were, was one of only six students at the time who actually ate in the kosher dining hall there. Um, uh, it's, I think, the food has improved since then. <laughs> uh, and. Um, and then at Vanderbilt, uh, you know, it was it was a very interesting experience for me being being in the South. Uh, I actually went to Vanderbilt after spending the summer in Israel um, doing an ulpan at uh, Harat Safim, um, and so it was a bit of a, a culture shock. And the the community there, led by Rabbi Posner, um, was very very welcoming, and you know, really w made my made my time there very special. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it. So where, where do you live? Hmm? 
So I guess the other thing I should mention, so, you know, going out from the Jewish thing to the professional is that um, I matched uh, at Bellevue Hospital, um, you know, when I was at Vandy, Nashville, right, I, I ended up going to Bellevue for my internship and residency in internal medicine. And I started there on July 1st, 1981. So if anybody has a history of medicine buff, um, they'll probably know the date June 5th, 1981, which was the date of the first publication of an AIDS patient. There are actually seven patients. Mm. Um, and this happened in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, the MMWR, that's published every week by the CDC. It was actually on page four. Um, you know, some weird cases of these young people who were dying of immunosuppressive uh, of diseases that were re related to immunosuppression, but there was no real good reason for them to be immunosuppressed. And to make a long story short, we were in the epicenter. We were, we were at, you know, really at the very, the big bang of, of, of AIDS um, uh, in, in New York City. And for a while, Bellevue had more cases of AIDS than anything else, any other place in the world. Uh, and we had no idea what was going on. Um, it was pretty crazy. We certainly didn't learn about it. In medical school, you know, it was one of those things where the interns knew as much or more as the attendings as the chairman of medicine. Um, anyway, it intrigued me and that defined my career. Uh, you know, I ended up going into infectious diseases, but really became an AIDS specialist. Um, worked with a guy, a wonderful man named Jerry Friedland up at Montefiore and Einstein, who taught me so much about medicine, about epidemiology, about patient care, about research. And then um, I, they started the Division of AIDS um, a few years before then, but it was really very small. And at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases run by a person who's now a world famous name, Tony Fauci. Um, so I, I joined the, the, um, the Division of AIDS um, back in 1989 and had the privilege of, of working under Dr. Fauci and learning a ton from him, um, you know, working on, on some critical issues regarding HIV. Um, and then just moved on and, and became more interested in vaccine development and went over to the FDA, learned the ins and outs of the regulation of vaccines, um, you know, testing for efficacy, testing for safety, um, and learn as much or more infectious disease in the seven years I spent at the Center for Biologics in the Office of Vaccines as I had my entire previous career. Obviously, it wasn't just AIDS Center. Uh, my last little stint was to serve as, as VP of Scientific Affairs for a small biotech nonprofit funded by the Gates Foundation called ARES, doesn't exist anymore, um, but it was to develop vaccines for tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. So um, that's sort of my, my bio. And what are you doing right now? So I'm doing a mix of things. I, I do some consulting. Um, you know, when, when, ARES, when, when ARES was not funded, unfortunately, uh, starting in 2017 uh, by, the, by the Gates changed its, its strategy. And a number of groups like ARES didn't get funded in tuberculosis vaccines, malaria vaccines, et cetera. I decided to go on my own because um, I also have an avocation of, of writing. And as you mentioned, I, you know, I have, a, I, I am a playwright. I have had a, a number of plays produced, but I've, I'm working on standing up a play off, off Broadway in, um, in February of 2022 on an, on an, an issue that I think would be interest of interest to your community. It's, it's called 14 days. And it is an adaptation of a memoir written by a good friend of mine, ambassador Dennis Ross, who, uh, led the, um, the, P the peace initiative, the Oslo plan. Um, and it, it, it is a, uh, it's a dramatization of the 14 days of the Camp David negotiation between Ehud Barak and Yasser Arafat that occurred uh, in July of uh, 2000. Um, and I'm writing my third novel and um, trying to be otherwise useful. <laughs> uh, so. Can you tell me, before we get into the actual vaccine questions and things like that, a lot of people have questions and I, want, I have my, my own questions. But before we get to that, I just wanted to ask you, could you think about, could you tell me how you feel that your Yiddishkeit affected your work? 
Was it something special about being Jewish, bringing it to the medical profession, helping people? I mean, how was your work informed by or affected by your Judaism? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I think, you know, I'm not a Talmudic scholar. Um, I don't pretend to be, uh, but I did have some teaching in that way. And, you know, the VA, you know, the concept, I guess, machloket, right? I mean, you have differences and, and, and trying to get to, trying to get to a, a principle, you know, um, being, being principled, principle driven is something that I, you know, keeping my mind open um, and not, well, open and not closed. Um, you know, when, you know, we, we were trying to figure out what HIV was. There were all kinds of theories being thrown around. It was cytomegalovirus, it was amyl nitrate, it was all, and we had to open our minds and say, maybe there's a new virus out there. And I think the idea of opening one's mind to, to possibilities, to thinking, I, you know, is, is that a Jewish thing? It's not just Jewish, but I think the way I was taught and, and also, you know, I, I think the... Well, I would say there's a critical thinking that Talmud gives, that definitely critical thinking. And, and, and the other and, thing... And searching for the truth and being willing to step back and say, well, what is the truth and what does it say? Yeah, and I think one of the other... The, another principle, there, you know, there are these... They're almost... They're almost well, I don't want to say trite, but they're, they're very important, you know, and, and, and some people throw them around a little bit too much. So I'll, I'll apologize ahead of time if I'm about to do that. But, you know, this concept of Lashon Hara, um, you know, there's probably many, many different levels of that um, that I don't fully understand. But to me, you know, part of it is to say, don't, you know, there's, there, you know, that's, it's, it's clearly intended to be, applied to interpersonal interactions. But I, I guess I, I'd like to think that you could expand that to say, don't be repeating things or mouthing things that aren't objectively based, if you understand what that objective basis is, because even if they're not targeting people, you're not saying something bad about a person, you're saying something bad or wrong potentially deliberately that can hurt people. And that actually might be worse than the original concept. So, you know, if there are objective facts, objective data, certainly people can agree, they can disagree around what to do with those data. But where I, what, where Jewishness gave me a grounding in how to address these kind of conflicts is to say you can't sort of make your make stuff up you know because that's it's kind of a different category of lishan hara yeah interesting very interesting all right let's get to it i'm going to invite people to later on to ask questions and uh if you'd like to text the question uh in the chat we can try and deal with it but but i have a bunch of questions that have been asked already that i'd like to deal with and we'll start with that Let's start by talking about, I guess, one of the controversial, I'm going to raise some controversial questions that people are asking. And, and um, how could it be that a vaccine could be developed so quickly? I mean, we talk about vaccines being tested and tested. It takes years to test the vaccine. And here we have Operation Warp Speed and boom, here we have a vaccine. I mean, I remember when the former president said, we're going to have a vaccine in a short while. And everybody thought he was blowing steam. And then all of a sudden, there it is. How does that happen? So it's a company. Um, one is that there's been an amazing technical revolution in our ability to do things on the genetic level. Um, we'll, we'll get to, you know, maybe we'll, we can talk about different kinds of vaccines, what we call vaccine platforms, vaccine strategies. This, the mRNA strategy, uh, you know, is, is brand new. This is the first time it's been applied like this. No one knew it was going to work this well. 
um, no, we weren't sure it was going to work at all. You know, the, the FDA put a 50% efficacy target saying if it was 50% efficacious, it would have been good enough. It turned out to be both mRNA is 95%, but I, I don't want to go off this, the topic. So how come so quickly? One slice of it, I'm going to say, is because it didn't happen so quickly. It, it kind of looked like it did, and it certainly did for this coronavirus. But it's really important to understand that there was 10 years of hard, intricate, elegant, and sometimes even thankless work that went in to our ability to develop these vaccines for this particular virus so quickly. Because if you think back like 10 years ago, people might remember SARS, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, what, you know, so this was, this was a disease, um, a pulmonary disease caused by a coronavirus. And it was killing people. Um, and that triggered the interest of a number of different researchers, including one who happened to be a friend of mine, Barney Graham at the Vaccine Research Center, um, to start to look at what about the coronavirus um, is, is a potential target for a vaccine. And, that, and he started, with, with his colleagues, started to focus in on the spike protein. A lot of you have heard of the spike protein. But this wasn't the spike protein for this particular coronavirus. This was the original SARS virus, okay? So he was working on that, but then through epidemiology and, you know, really good public health measures and the fact that the original SARS virus didn't spread as easily as this particular SARS variant, uh, coronavirus variant, um, it kind of blew over. And then came MERS, which is another coronavirus, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And suddenly his work became more relevant again. His funding level is going up and down and up and down. But it doesn't matter because he's still studying it. And then MERS kind of blew itself out. And they kept plugging along fairly thanklessly. And then this hit. And... The reason this is called SARS-CoV-2, that's the actual name of the virus, it's the SARS coronavirus 2. It's son of SARS, okay? But because Barney and his colleagues had done the preliminary 10 years of work looking at the spike protein and what pieces of the spike protein are critical to raise immune responses and particularly antibody responses against when this thing hit he had those sequences and he and his colleagues at the NIH and, and elsewhere I think one was based in Texas um, gave the sequences of the of these proteins to basically whoever wanted them among the vaccine manufacturers so the manu vaccine manufacturers had 10-year head start they didn't have to search for the antigenic moiety of the virus. They had it, okay? At least they thought they had it because of Barney's work. What, what the vaccine manufacturers had were different strategies to use that moiety, that sequence, to build vaccines. So when that happened, when the you know, it was basically a, a relay race. And when, when the folks at VRC handed off that sequence, uh, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, J&J &J all ran with it. AstraZeneca ran with a different sequence. Okay. Can you, can you, can you address that? Okay, so basically what you're saying, there's been a tremendous amount of research. It doesn't happen overnight. Can you, can you briefly address and explain what a vaccine does and the difference between the vaccines. You may want to show something to, to help us understand that, but well, can, you, can you just briefly address that? What is a vaccine? How does it work? And what is specific about the mRNA? What's new about the mRNA vaccine? So I do, I do have a few slides. 
Um, the question is <laughs> how to get to them without messing everything up. I mean, would, do you want me to go to that slide? If you just very briefly, uh, let's see if you can explain that. I just think it might be easier right. if you use the. All right. So, so what a vaccine is broadly is just, it's a way of tricking your immune system to thinking that it's seen an infectious agent when it really hasn't. What it's, so, so one of the key principles of immunity is that you don't develop an immune response to the entire bug, even a tiny virus. You don't develop an immune response to the virus. You develop it to specific pieces of the virus that are critical in the viral life cycle. For a virus, it's usually the protein sticking out of its capsule that allows it to bind to specific receptors on the cells that it attacks. And in this case, uh, in, in, the, in the case of the, 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 um, uh, this coronavirus, um, the, the receptor primarily on your respiratory epithelial cells, okay? Um, and when they get in there and they go through the replication cycle, they damage or kill those cells and they cause grave damage to lungs and et cetera. And that's how people get sick and die. So what a vaccine does in this case is to say, okay, there's this piece that, that binds the receptor. Let's make an antibody. Uh, let, let's, let's, let's take that piece show it to the immune response without having the virus there and allow the immune response to then think the virus is there, raise antibodies, raise cells that will have a memory of that particular molecular sequence that is the piece of the spike protein that binds. I, I've used the analogy like a, like a key into a lock, okay? And, and so what what those antibodies will do, it's like picky, t taking gum and, and putting it on the key. So if, 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 you know, normally it would have a nice fit, if gum is there, boom, doesn't work. And if, it, and if it doesn't work, the virus can't get in the cells, the virus can't get in the cells, the virus can't damage the cells, and you don't get sick. That's what a vaccine does. Okay, so how is the MRI? Really important point though about yes why this was so quick, because it goes with, with what I just said. I'm talking about this one little piece of this one little protein, kind of a, a mish of spaghetti-like strands called the spike protein. It's one little piece of it that you're protecting against, right? Because that's what binds. That is not always the case. There are more complicated uh, organisms where you can't just say there's one antigen that you need to make a uh, immune response against. When I was doing TB research, TB vaccine research, there were more than 4,000 antigens on that mycobacteria. And we still don't know which permutation combination of all those 4,000 are necessary to protect against when making a vaccine. And that's why we still don't have one weird exception called BCG, we still don't have a, a good vaccine against TB. Whereas in, you know, after giving the sequence within, within six weeks, we had vaccine in people's arms against this particular virus. Cause it actually, once you know that antigen, it was really easy to do. Mm -hmm. So what's the mRNA chiddush? What's new about the mRNA that's different from the previous vaccines for measles, for mumps, for, uh, for smallpox, for, for uh, um, the other diseases. Yeah, great there. question. So this gets into the concept, I've mentioned it, this, this concept of vaccine platforms or vaccine strategies. So for decades, you basically had two flavors of vaccines. You had, with, with some minor variations, you had vaccines that were live example, live but weakened examples of the pathogen. And you have vaccines that were killed versions of the pathogen, mm -hmm. but you were injecting the pathogen. They work really well, especially the live, what are called live, the weakened, the word is attenuated, live attenuated vaccines. Measles, mumps, rubella, 
a number of those. Smallpox is a variation on the theme because you're really taking a cowpox that's been passaged and then given. And by the way, if anyone ever questioned whether vaccines work, you know, uh, we're smallpox, right? Smallpox is the only human disease that's been eradicated. Um, you know, for, from, from 1900 to its eradication in 1971, 300 million people died just in those 71 years from smallpox. Well, now it's gone. You don't get vaccinated for smallpox. But that, those were the techniques. Those were the, the, the platforms. When people then got better at molecular biology, then you could start to present the proteins that were relevant to developing the immune response against. Sometimes those proteins or those proteins or the sugar coated proteins called glycoproteins didn't work as well as one might have hoped. So you gave other things, you did other manipulations, you could bind them to other molecules, then you they developed things called adjuvants that uh, boost the immune responses in ways that we're still trying to understand, but are very effective, um, can be effective. And by the way, uh, that is a strategy being taken against uh, the COVID virus, uh, Novavax. Uh, it, hasn't, it, it hasn't been uh, released yet, but it probably will be. It's a very effective vaccine and it's a adjuvanted protein. And the protein is that spike protein. mRNA. When I first saw mRNA, when I was at the FDA, I thought it was science fiction. I thought these guys, are, what are they thinking? How can you do an mRNA vaccine? And the reason is because um, RNA is really quickly degraded. You know, DNA lasts forever. Yeah, can you simplify it, please, a little bit? A little yeah, bit sure. for, for those of us who mm -hmm. don't get what RNA and what DNA is, I don't want to go too deep into it. But right. Just if you can tell us a little bit simplified, what is RNA? And right, so DNA is our genetic code. Okay. You can get, and, and it lasts. I mean, you're getting DNA from, you know, mastodon fossil. You're getting DNA from dinosaurs. You know, I mean, it's, you know, the whole Jurassic Park thing, you know, it's the DNA in the, in the amber. DNA lasts forever. Almost. RNA goes away really fast. Now, how does DNA relate to RNA? And how does RNA relate to proteins, right? Because that's, you know, we're proteins, we're enzymes, we're, you know, it's who we are and comes from our genetic code. DNA is our genetic code, but that code has to be transcribed into RNA. And then the RNA has to be translated into protein. And there's this really elegant way that our bodies do it. And that's part of a biochemistry course. And I'm guessing there's not time to talk about that tonight, um, but that's what you learn. All right. DNA to RNA to protein. There are exceptions. HIV goes RNA to DNA to RNA to protein, but we're not talking about HIV tonight. Um, so when, the, when DNA is being read, DNA is always being read in your cells, messages are being sent out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm in your cells to make proteins. And those proteins run our bodies. They, 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 they construct who we are and they run it. The enzymes and, and some, the poisons that people take are poisons that inhibit the ability of the body, one of the key points, you know, to inhibit the body of making proteins. It's one of the things that can kill you very quickly. So DNA to RNA to protein. But those, those messages that come in the form of messenger RNA, right? So this messenger RNA that comes out of the DNA, that leaves the nucleus, that goes in the cytoplasm, that goes to the ribosomes to have protein made, needs to go away. Because you can't keep, re it would be like a record that was stuck, right? You just want to hear, so you make your protein and you're done. 
Thank you, mRNA, go away. Really hard, quickly degraded. Enzymes, boom, take care of it. But just and to get to get to now to the talk list of this, so the mRNA vaccine is actually sending a message, short-term message to the body, correct. right? Correct. So, so uh, let me just get to, so, so here's the thing about the mRNA vaccine. What these guys did was brilliant. They said, you know, DNA is sending a message to create these proteins uh, via the mRNA, okay? Why don't we send a message to create the proteins versus the mRNA? The proteins being the antigens, antigens standing for antibody generating, in this case, proteins. But how do you do it? And what they did, they solved the problem of having it degraded by putting them in nanoparticles of specially constructed fat droplets. And these fat droplets are different between the Pfizer BioNTech and the Moderna, but they're the same idea. And they protect the mRNA long enough to allow the mRNA to get into your cells, not into your nucleus. These mRNAs don't go anywhere near your nucleus. People say, oh, it's gonna you know, turn you into a turnip. Change of DNA, it's right. It's not. Okay, this doesn't go anywhere near your DNA. It's just out there where your other messengers go. In your cytoplasm of your muscle cells, it gets read into the protein that is constructed, that is coded for in that strand of mRNA. In this case, that strand of mRNA carries the code for the piece of the spike protein against which you need to develop those antibodies. Mm. And that's how this mRNA, these mRNA vaccines work. Okay, now let's get down to some very practical stuff. That was actually very fascinating, and I appreciate you sharing that with us. Because a lot of people have a question about this new mRNA, this new idea. Okay, let's move on to a few other questions. And I'm going to ask the questions, and sometimes, perhaps, if you will forgive me, they're sounding like um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to attack. I'm trying to ask, and based on questions that I've heard from people, and you know, people question. Sure, so, sure. first of all, there are all kinds of cures now that are coming up. Are coming up that people are coming up with um, for for the COVID nineteen. Number one, number two, there are a lot of people who haven't gotten so sick. Why vaccinate everybody when there are some cures and? The vaccination, we still don't have, you know, we still don't know exactly what the long-term effects of the vaccination are. So we don't know how long it's going to last, et cetera. So why not just use the, the new, develop the new medicines and just rely on that? Um, number one, you have to understand what those new medicines are that, you see, so when you, when you call them cures, they're not cures. I mean, the only... The only interventions that have been thus far proven to be useful against actual COVID disease are monoclonal antibodies. Okay. Um, and what a monoclonal antibody is, is a way for a company to do what a vaccine is doing inside people who are vaccinated. Come up with those antibodies that can protect people from replication of, 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 the COVID, of COVID, of the COVID virus. However, they are very expensive. They are all, and they always will be in short supply. And any time, and they will be, up, and, they, and they don't have nearly the efficacy in preventing people from getting serious disease as vaccines do. You know, when we talk about, by the time you were to be administered one of these monoclonals, you're already pretty sick. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the outcome is, it would not be clear, okay? Understand what we mean by efficacy of vaccine, okay? You know, we're talking about 95%. So 95% efficacy, you know, that's, 
that's compared to the placebo. You're actually talking about, you know, I think four in 0.04% of people getting the vaccine actually developed COVID, any layer of COVID. That is even the most mild symptoms. Okay. So four in 10,000. Wow. Um, 100% of those people, there were no people in a clinical trial who died, right? So the ability to apply that kind of prevention in a rapid, inexpensive, and very safe way is far superior from a public health perspective, from an individual health perspective, than anything that an intervention could provide. Look, it's great to have interventions and people are still working on those monoclonals. In case, you know, the, just because you see 100% protection in a trial doesn't mean you're gonna see 100% protection in populations, okay? It's not gonna work that way. And it's great to have that safety net. But you, there's, you know, you, there's no way, there's no way that you can say, okay, well, let's just sit back and let people get sick and we're just go ahead and treat people who need it with these monoclones. You know, you, you got to have them in hospital. You got to put IVs in. You, you know, they're expensive. They're, it, it's, it's not. Now, then the question is, is there a downside to vaccines? I mean, Right. One of the we, right. that we talked about is how how safe are vaccines? Okay, how safe is this vaccine? The the the, the mRNA vaccines, even the J and J, the J and J had some issues that were that resulted, or at least it appeared to have some issues that resulted in the stoppage of the trial and a f a further close look at the data strongly suggested that those issues of uh, thrombosis that were being seen in the, in the uh, youngish women were not causal to the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Understand, having worked again seven years at the FDA doing vaccine, clinical vaccine review, safety is the number one priority, right? By the way, we do not come under pressure from companies. We pressure companies. Okay, I wanted to, okay. can I stop you there for a second? Yeah, sure. Okay, so there is a perception by many that big pharma has, you know, they they spend billions of dollars or millions of dollars on uh, on lobbying right. and on advertising, and that they have the uh, politicians in the back pocket, and maybe the CDC in the back pocket, and that uh, the Johnson and Johnson look how quickly. I mean, they had a problem, and all of a sudden, boom, it's over because probably they put a lot of pressure on people. You, you know, you know, the people there, the CDC, I think, or the NIH. <laughs> Tell me, can you address that? Because and, and then we can get back to what you were saying. But yeah, you address that? it's it's I, it's really an unfortunate perception. Um, I, I don't know if I can talk people out of that perception. Again, I work there. Talk about the Jewish values. I, you know, I say the people I work with, none of them were in the pocket of anybody. They were independent scientists. Okay, we took that role really seriously. And it's, it's, it's really frustrating. It's really frustrating to hear that people don't trust you. Uh, but you know, it goes with the ter territory. It's not gonna ruin my day. It's not gonna ruin their day. But understand that um, you, that, that we, that the FDA, um, under, understand that we, that the FDA understands the, 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 the highest bar of safety that has to go into approving uh, licensing, even approving for emergency use authorization of vaccine. Why? Why, why, why do you have a higher, like a way higher bar for a vaccine safety issue than for a drug safety issue? Well, the reason is that drugs are targeted to people with the disease. When you, if you're, God forbid, getting chemo, okay, you're getting, the chemo has really, a lot of the chemo has really bad side effects, okay? You can't just 
give people that. But, but it's, it's, it's licenses. They are approved. And the reason is because everything at FDA is risk-benefit balancing. Right. So if there's people who need to go through some really tough times with chemotherapy to save their lives because they have cancer, those drugs are going to be approved. When you give out a vaccine, you're giving it potentially to 300 million people in this country, and the vast majority of them will not see COVID. We know that. At least if the vaccine is used appropriately um, and protects people and you get anywhere close to herd immunity or whatever. So you can't have any kind of important safety signals in a vaccine that's going to be used that widely, period. Mm. That doesn't mean that there, that there may not be a safety signal of some sort. I mean, of, of a, a side effect. I mean, people who have gotten the, the mRNAs know, I, I certainly, when I got my second dose of Moderna, you know, I was sick the next day and I was happy for it, you know, said, okay, my immune res response is doing what it's supposed to be. It doesn't mean you have to have that to have an effective vaccine, but it was like, okay, do your stuff. I'm good. I'll spend the day in bed. Thank you. You know, I also had a big side effect when I had my vaccine that I was able to hug my grandchildren. That to me is a huge side effect. Thank you. Yeah. But anyway, uh, let me ask you, um, I, I know we left the server, but I want to move on to a couple of other practical questions. So if somebody had the, had COVID and I guess they've developed antibodies, do they need to get the vaccine? That's a really great question. And here's, you know, you talk about going back to the, the Jewish, you know, perceptions, keeping your mind open. So, you know, for me, at the beginning of this pandemic, when, when the vaccines were coming down the pike, my guess, my guess, educated guess, was no, you wouldn't need it. Um, and I thought, well, that's, and that would be good because then, you know, we didn't have enough and we could spread them out. Well, it turns out that apparently you do. Um, and and it, it, that, the, that the vaccine serves as a kind of boost to the natural infection. Um, and, and so that, that frankly was a surprise to me. But again, where did that come from? It came from data. Uh, you know, it, it came from people studying these, these things and making recommendations based on the data they have and maybe some assumptions based on the data that they didn't. Maybe it's better, you know, safe than so sorry to give, to give. But you're, you're, the shorter answer is the recommendation is that even if you've had COVID, you should get your vaccine. Both shots or just one? I think just one might be enough. Well, that becomes an even more complicated issue. Right now, the recommendation is for both, but it's not a hard recommendation. And I know I was talking when I was doing Zalman's uh, uh, you know, discussion last week that I myself, because I volunteer to give vaccines in, in Montgomery County, Metal, uh, Maryland here, um, there was a, a guy who came in and, you know, we asked a series of questions. Have you had COVID before? The guy says, yes. Uh, have, uh, he was a policeman. Uh, it was back in October. He was sick for a week. And I said, so what happened if your first, so he was getting the second vaccination. And he said, yeah, after my first vaccination, I was sick again for a week. Fevers, chills, malaise. And I, you know, I said, wow, I don't think I want to give you your second vaccination. I think, I, I think as an infectious disease guy, you know, what, what you, what I saw, what you experienced, what I'm hearing from you, didn't see it, but I'm hearing from you, is that you, that was a boost. And unless someone tells me otherwise, you know, let's follow recommendations, that, but I don't want to give you the second vaccination. I don't, I don't think it's necessary and I don't want to make you sick. Mm -hmm. so, that was just a personal call on my part. Right. Um, but, but, you know, would I have given it to him if he said, yeah, I got the first vaccine and I was fine? Yes, I would have. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we don't know is how long the vaccine, I don't think, is how long the vaccine's effects will last. So how long we will remain immune. It, 
one of the things that people are afraid of is, you know, we're going to have to have a boost or every, who knows how long, every six months, every year. Are we really eradicating this disease? Is it going to stay with us? Are we protecting ourselves for long term? Do we know? All right. So there's a couple of people to that question. Um, in terms of duration of the effect, uh, no one knows. Um, you know, however, the data, and no one knows because we haven't had time to find out. Right. Um, it's one of the key things being studied. It's being studied very intensively and data just came out, I think last week or the week before, suggesting that for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, it was 90% efficacious after six months. Mm -hmm. That's really good, mm -hmm. okay? So you're still getting a very high level of protection after six months. Might, you know, what's gonna happen for a, a year from now? I don't know. Um, are there, you know, will, 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 you, will you see a drop off of, 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 of protection? You will, there's going to be a drop off. But that happens to every vaccine. Um, how much of a drop off? We'll find out. How will the variants that are being, uh, uh, you know, popping up here, there, and other, how, how may they affect, you know, recommendations as to boosters and whatnot? I don't know. You know, we, it's, this, is, this, this, is, this is an experience that we are living through real time. We have to be, we have to have a degree of humility here. We are learning. Tony Fauci is learning. We are all learning on the fly, right? And, and so don't, don't expect that everyone's going to have right now to know what the story is going to be six months ago. You want to take some guesses? I'll give you some guesses. But don't hold me to it. Um, now, okay. terms of, oh, I want to get to the eradication issue. Yes, yes. Okay. I think we should just stop thinking about eradication. Okay. I, I don't think this virus is going to be eradicated. Smallpox was eradicated, but it was a very unique set of situations that resulted in that. You know, um, why a vac why a, 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 a germ can be eradicated is a topic for a course, not just a, a lecture. Um, but here you have these variants that keep evolving. You have the fact that we're not developing herd immunity anytime soon. You have the fact that this virus is not just unique to humans, it came from bats probably. So it has an animal reservoir. So even if we were miraculously to vaccinate the entire world with a tremendously efficacious vaccine, that, you know, that virus is still out there in the animal kingdom. And as our immunity wanes, as that virus changes to be a little bit easier to escape some of that immunity we've given ourselves through vaccination and through natural infection, it's like it'll come back, come back in a different form, come back weaker, come back what, but it's not, it's not disappearing. I, 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 I don't think. Okay. I have two more questions. I'm going to open it up to, to everyone. One question is, so I got my vaccination. I'm double vaccinated. Do I still need to wear a mask? Do I have to be careful where I go? Uh, there was some initially, there was some concern that maybe you'd still be able to pass on the illness. Where, where do we stand now? Can I just go anywhere into, into a restaurant, into a store without any worry? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, let's, just, let's just divide it up into outdoor and indoor, okay? If you're vaccinated and you're outdoors... This is my opinion, okay? And CDC may have, this is just me. If you're vaccinated and you're outdoors, you basically do not have to wear a mask, period, okay? There are some exceptions. If you, I mean, from, from a scientific perspective, you know, in terms of either putting myself at risk or putting others at risk, Okay. If you're outdoors, for the most part, you do not have to wear a, va a mask if you're vaccinated. I don't think that is much different from what Biden just said and CDC just said. You know, 
if you're in a situation where it's crowded and stagnant, okay, I mean, think about protests, think about parades, think about, you know, that funeral, you know, uh, just we, we saw pictures from Israel. It would be prudent for everyone in that kind of stagnant, close pressed, crowded situation where people are also talking, yelling, crying, singing, whatever, to wear masks. That's prudent. Um, that's outdoors. Indoors, I'm still wearing masks in public, except if I go into a restaurant and I'm seated, and then obviously I need to take my mask off. But I don't frequent restaurants that much anymore. Um, I, 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 I'm still not, I mean, I'll do it, but it's not something I run out to do. So you, you're suggesting not to throw all caution to the wind. You're, you're suggesting still to be careful. And, yeah, and you know, you get into this situation where is it likely you're going to be infected? No. Is it likely that you're going to transmit? Well, no, because you're not going to be infected or diseased. Um, sometimes you're doing it because you're putting other people at ease. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, because you don't know who's vaccinated and who's not. And if you're getting infected, are you getting it light, milder? You, you have less chance of morbidity, you have less chance of dying from well, yeah. I mean, if you're vaccinated, that's what the vaccines show. Remember what the, what the end point is for vaccines. It's not prevention of infection. It's prevention of symptomatic disease, even one symptom. Very few, I'm not sure there's any actually, maybe, I don't want to start speculating, especially if I'm being recorded, because uh, I'll get it wrong. Um, for the most part, vaccines don't prevent infection, which makes sense, right? Because you've you've built up an immune response, a memory immune response to inhibit the replication and disease causing potential of a pathogen, but that pathogen has to infect you to trigger that memory response. Yes. Yes. Okay. I understand. But it's going to, it's going to protect against the serious illness. Right. So, so it is, you know, again, are there data? I don't know, but just being, just being commonsensical, or, you know, deriving okay. principles, the, the likelihood is that if you're vaccinated, you have a extremely, extremely low probability of becoming infected in a way that would transmit that virus. Okay. That's my understanding. Yeah. And finally, I don't know if you want to answer this question or not, but I was helping someone today to set up an appointment and they had a choice between the Moderna, the Pfizer or the Johnson & Johnson. Which one would you choose? Um, well, since I'm not beholden to anyone, I mean, the, the honest answer, I mean, my daughter got j and I got Moderna and my wife got Moderna and my son got Moderna because that was being... You take the vaccine that's available. Yeah, but if you have a choice of three, which this particular place offers a choice of three. If you had the choice of three, I'd go with the mRNA vaccines. And which had, one? Which one? The Moderna seems to have a stronger response, immune you response. Can't, you can't parse between a 94%, 95% efficacy. No, I, not the efficacy. I'm talking about, I'm talking about response. Effect. Side yeah, effect. I've heard that too. Um, I don't know if there's data on that. And frankly, this, it's, it's so minimal and so transient that it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, my honest answer, honest, straight, no, no chachmas, as they say, right, um, is, is uh, if, if, you're, if I were given the choice, I would take Pfizer-BioNTech, I would take Moderna, boom, okay? Mm -hmm. But if I'm not having a choice, would I have, they, you know, my daughter who was in Brooklyn, said, you know, I'm at Walgreens and they're offering J&J, &J. is it okay? I said, take it now. Mm. Boom, get it. But you can't mix and match though. You can't take no, one you can't. Moderna. Okay, you do not do that. Right. And the reason, I mean, you, yeah, I saw that as a question. You do not want to do that. Why do you not do not want to do that? Because there's no data 
to suggest, this is me as the FDX FDA guy, okay? You don't want to start making assumptions when the assumptions are not necessarily necessary to be made. If you were stuck, okay, if, if the Moderna manufacturing plant burned down and you had, to, you know, yet tomorrow, and you had 50 million people vaccinated with first dose of Moderna, and the only thing they could get was a second dose of Pfizer. Could you do it? Probably yes. Mm. But there's no reason to do it. There's no data to support it. And, um, you know, maybe somebody's doing that study. I don't know. Uh, it, it's complicated because you have different companies and the, you know, da, da, da. But um, no, you don't mix and match. You just All st right. stick to the program. Okay, I want to invite anybody to ask any questions. If you want to challenge, to challenge, but please with res respectfully. Um, if anybody would like to ask any questions, anybody, uh, you can either chat or uh, put your hand up and we will invite you to ask a question. Anybody? Doctor, when did they first, oops. Is that too? Okay. When did they first discover or realize that they could transmit with RNA? You know, that's a really good question. I don't, you know, I should have paid more attention to the, to the history uh, articles that have been written. It, it's a very interesting story of this Turkish couple who moved to Germany and came up with this idea. Um, and I, I, I think it was, you know, 10 to 15 years ago where they came up with this, this concept. Um, but again, the issue was how to protect the mRNA and they eventually solved that. Okay. Um, Diana, uh, Diane, I had a question, I had a hand up, I think. Yeah. What happens if you're allergic to medicines? Should you take the shot? So... The answer is yes, because a broad allergy to medicines, you know, is not necessarily applicable to this particular vaccine. You know, and there's, there's not a whole lot in this vaccine. Um, even, if, even if you had a reaction like an epileptic fit? Yes. Now, when, when you are given the vaccine, and again, I know this because I've been given it, right? I've been giving it out. You're asked about immune response, I mean, uh, uh, bad responses. And there are different categories of, you know, observation that occur when someone reports having a different kind of uh, uh, reaction, allergic reaction to something or other. But, you know, so if you've had anaphylactic, you're going to have a half an hour observation. And by the way, we do keep EpiPens that, you know, an epileptic fit is not an anaphylactic reaction. It's different. But if, you, if there is someone who's had epilepsy triggered by some drug, there's no suggestion that this vaccine or any of the vaccine, this I'm thinking the mRNAs, but even you know the J and J, um, would be would be something that would trigger that. I, I I don't think it's ever been reported. And and now there's ten hundreds of millions of people, hundreds of millions, given this particular vaccine. So it's you know again everything's risk benefit, and you know people's people are always saying, is it safe? Is it safe? Is it, you know it, it, that's not the question. The question is what's the risk of doing it versus the risk of not doing it? And the risk of not doing it is the risk of acquiring COVID. And COVID is, it's kind of like playing Russian roulette. You may be totally fine and you may die and you may have something in between. And we still don't know why. We still don't have a full understanding of the pathogenesis, the pathophysiology of this virus. Even as Tony Fauci says, it, it surprises him all the time. The more he learns about this, it surprises all of us. So I think we have to respect the virus, balance risk and benefit, 
And even with that kind of history, I wouldn't hesitate to get the vaccine. Okay, I have three people with their hands up. Barry? Yeah, I'd like to ask the doctor if he's familiar with the uh, two early trials that are being done in Israel that are supposed to be a cure. They're CD24 protein. Uh, they work on that protein. I am not. Okay. Uh, but, but um, you know, I think, you know, if, if someone has a good idea um, and someone can prove it on the basis of a, you know, randomized controlled trial, more power to them. Two phase one trials, no one has died. Well, yes, no one can die. But the, the question is going to be, when you're talking about this, remember, when you're talking about a drug versus a vaccine, you're going to have to target that. And you can't, you, can, you know, a, a, dr a drug is not something you're going to give to the world. I, you know, a CD4, they could be very important. I'm not trying to poo-poo it, you know, but, you know, just like monoclonals could be very important. If, you know, for whatever reason, you actually acquire, you develop COVID, um, you haven't been vaccinated, you're one of the four in 10,000 for whom they, you know, there was an infection that some variant comes up and somehow gets around it. You get, it's really good to have, op to have options that will mitigate the worst possible outcomes. That's really good to have, but that's not the public health tool that you need to actually get us out of this mess. Right. And my, my understanding, the reason why these uh, vaccines came so fast, it was uh, the speed up was done on the bureaucratic end, not on the clinical trial end. No. So, so you have to, you have to make a distinction. You're right in terms of getting these things made. You know, the warp speed now, the, the, you know, this, the, the, this the plan that's grown out of warp speed was really a smart thing. It was a public-private partnership. And what it did was take the risk out of developing, um, of, of, of making investment, of the, of the companies, of, uh, of making investments in vaccine manufacturing infrastructure and also you know, embarking on these very expensive clinical trials, normally a company progresses in a very meticulous, careful way down the pathway from preclinical to clinical phase one, phase two, phase three. Why? Because they want to get it right because the FDA is looking over their shoulders saying, you better get it right. We need to review every step of the way. And because there's money involved, it's a huge risk. You know how many, va you know how many interventions, whether it be vaccines, drugs, whatever, fail after they get into phase one, even phase two, even phase three. 80%. And these phase three trials run, yeah, I mean, it's, it's huge. I'd like, to, I'd like to interrupt and I'd like to move on. To, because we have a few other people. If you want to just finish the thought, please go ahead. But I, I want to move on to another question. No, I just want to do, I do want to say that what, what this warp speed did was allow these companies to build manufacturing plants, to go, just basically go from phase one to phase three and, and, and you know, kind of go phase one and mush phase two and phase three together without putting themselves financially at risk. The, the, the government stepped in and said, we got your back here. And it was very important to do. Okay, Simone. Hi, um, Simone's daughter, actually, but I, I have a two-part question. Um, first is, do you have any speculations, or for that matter, concerns about the long-term effects of the vaccine? And then to piggyback on that, how can we be confident about the long-run impact on our bodies? Okay, so you're talking from safety, not the long-term like efficacy of the vaccine. Correct. Yeah, I don't, I don't see why there would be a concern about a long-term effect of the vaccine. It goes away really fast. Remember, you're not doing anything that your body itself isn't doing all the time. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you, you are, you, all you're doing with these vaccines is asking your body, is giving your body an opportunity to create immunological memory, to create, well, even, even before immunological memory, to actually create antibody so that if you do get exposed immediately, you have some antibody on board and then have the memory um, to do that if you do get exposed down the road when your antibody titers fall. There's nothing weird. There's nothing new. Um, there's, there's nothing, you know, science fiction-y about what these vaccines do. You know, where you can, you know, you, let's have that conversation when we were talking about gene therapy. I mean, gene therapy, let's, you know, we can talk about that. That that's pretty advanced science fictiony stuff, um, and there are very big levels of ethics special panels. That if you're a gene, if you're developing gene therapy, if you're developing something that's going to go into your own genome and basically be a part of you potentially for as long as you live, and maybe even pass down to your kids, but I don't even want to go there. Um, that's going to take a very high level of scrutiny. This is not that, okay? This is just just a new way of doing something that, um, you know, has been done for the last 120, 130 years, even, even longer when you consider, you know, Edward Jenner and smallpox. Um, and, this, and this is way safer than that. Uh, you know, so I, I honestly do not have, I do not have any concerns about either short-term or long-term safety of the vaccines that are out there being used for this. I just don't. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And I wanted to ask if you yourself would, um, if you go to a, a enclosed place like a room when you know all the others are vaccinated would would you consider it safe to sit without masks like in a workplace in a meeting room or in a house where you know the others are vaccinated would you take the chance yes i would i would i would consider it a low risk situation our shul is dealing with that you know we're we're getting back to having in person services soon And one of the criteria, at least for the time being, is that everyone has to show their vaccine card. And, 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 and if everyone's vaccinated and they've gone, you know, through the time, then uh, people will not be masked. So, yeah, it's, 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 it should be fine. I see. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I have a hand up and it's number 0123, whoever you are, please. Yeah, that's uh, Ruben Kagan. Uh, so the oh, question hi. is, hello, hello. So I was very sick about a year ago. So I was, so to say, naturally vaccinated. <laughs> so I wonder, should I still consider to have a vaccine? Because I still have uh, antibodies. And I wonder if that's the case with uh, vaccination. Should I, should I do the vaccination? Yeah. So you, you were documented to have COVID a year ago? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the recommendation is to go ahead and get yourself vaccinated. It will prolong the prote- protection. You know, we sort of touched on that. And, and the question is whether you need a second vaccination after it. And, you know, my right now, the, the, the recommendation is that you get the full, full course. But I think there's room for flexibility should you develop, you know, kind of intense side effects from your first vaccination. I might consider not getting the second vaccination and And then just kind of following news reports and following recommendations and seeing whether, you know, down the road, that second vaccination might be something you get. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of ad living here. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Anyone else want to ask something quickly before we wrap up? Yes. This is um, a little off topic, but <clears throat> has it been considered with the efficacy of the um, uh, mRNA Uh, using that whole idea, you know, the, the sticky gum idea for um, uh, cancer? Absolutely. Okay. Um, in fact, BioNTech, you know, there's Pfizer-BioNTech, and actually BioNTech's use of the mRNA has actually 
more focused in on a cancer vaccine than it is infectious diseases. Pfizer's doing more of the infectious diseases part. Moderna's entire, but Moderna, if you actually go to their website, you see what they're working on. You know, it's actually really kind of cool. Um, you know, they're, they, you know, they're conceptually, they would like to do a combination flu, uh, 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 flu COVID vaccine. Yeah. You know, maybe you get it every year. Um, you know, there, there are other interventions, uh, other, other uh, uh, viruses, other uh, diseases, Ebola, um, Zika, uh, you know, all kinds of types of diseases for which this mRNA technology could be applied and cancers. And by the way, they're even looking at it for things like cystic fibrosis to see whether there's a way of delivering, or I talked to the young woman who asked about gene therapy. It's not exactly gene therapy, but it's delivering the mRNA to code for the protein that's missing mm -hmm. in cystic fibrosis to see if that could um, be something that could be an applied, an applied use of this new technology. This is new stuff. When, when the mRNA data when the efficacy data came out, this is in the New Yorker, okay? Barney Graham was my chief resident at Vanderbilt, um, who, who uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, was working on this for the last 10 years, and in my opinion, deserves a Nobel Prize. Um, he cried, you know? I mean, they didn't know, they didn't know it was gonna work. He cried. I mean, the FDA said, you know what? You show us 50% efficacy, protect 50% more than placebo, and you're good to go. And they got 95%. And then they had an internal control or internal, a, a kind of control, because you had two different mRNA companies, and both of them were within a percent of each other. And talk about an Israeli study, when the Israelis actually did kind of this population-based study of how... I think this was the Pfizer vaccine, uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine was working in their population. So you're not talking about efficacy, you're talking about of effectiveness. Usually the effectiveness is down. It was up, it was 97%. So it's unbelievable. I mean, it's, and, and the last thought I'm gonna put out there is that, you know, looking for silver linings is that you know, pandemics happen. Um, we were overdue for one. I, when I used to teach a vaccine development course at Hopkins, I used to tell the students that in their lifetimes, the biggest that I thought that they'd face is another influenza pandemic, something akin to what happened in 1918. Um, we're still overdue for that. You know, that, that's going to happen. But now we have a technology that's proven that can be turned around really fast. And I think we all can feel a lot, I feel a lot better for that because not just for me, for my kids, you know. Um, so we, we've seen it, we've watched it go from essentially a concept to a brand new, incredibly useful platform. And so there's a- two more. I have two more people who want to ask, and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, sure. Lois had a question, and Stella had a question. Lois, there, there are there are some doctors who are recommending taking ivermectin to boost the immune system. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, please don't do that. Just, just say no. Okay. Just don't. Okay. There's no good data. And, you know, I wouldn't take Tylenol unless I had to. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to do it. And I, I mean, I feel really strongly about this, obviously. Yeah. You know, doctors shouldn't be saying stuff like that. Stella? Stella, did you want to say something? You need to unmute. Can you do it? I'm here. What are your thoughts about children vaccination? 
A really good question. If this is the last question, it's a really good one. I can't wait to get these, the, to, to have the um, indication expanded. Uh, I think it's going to happen within the next day or two down to like 12 years old. I think the, uh, the vaccine, that the, 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 the FDA is going to make that announcement, I'm guessing. And so I've been reading like it's expected. And, and again, you know, what you're seeing, and it's, it's, not, it's not surprising, is that the younger you get, you're, you're even getting higher, higher efficacy. You're getting, I think, the Pfizer-BioNTech trial, the 12 to 16-year-old trial showed, at least I read, 100% efficacy, you know, um, against developing symptomatic disease. Kids get better immune systems than, than adults. I, I mean, have better immune responses to vaccines than adults do. Uh, Moderna is doing a study. I, I was just looking at clinicaltrials.gov. Um, I think it's six months to something, six months to 12 years. There's no reason to think that this vaccine isn't going to be safe for kids. None. And there is a real, if diminished, a real risk that the virus hurts children. Not at the level, not at the frequency it hurts adults, but there are children who have been hurt by this. There are children who have died. And I told my kids from the very beginning, my kids are in their 20s. I said, please don't get this. You know, do not take, you know, I've said, and, and Zalman's heard me say this like already 15 times, you know, you don't have to fear the virus. You shouldn't fear it, but respect it. Understand where it is and where it's unlikely to be. And when you have the opportunity to protect yourself with it and protect your, your loved ones and your community, take that opportunity. And if you have questions, seek answers. If you don't believe what I'm saying, ask somebody else. But get the right answers. Get the data. And for kids, there's no reason to think that everyone shouldn't, all kids shouldn't be vaccinated. The FDA is being, you know, people say, oh, you, the FDA did things too quickly. Understand that FDA isn't going to say anything about anything that it doesn't have data for. That's their policy. And the reason that you don't see an EUA emergency use authorization for kids yet is that there's no data. So they said to the companies, bring us data. And as soon as those data come in, boom, as long as they, you know, add up, they don't show any problems, they're going to be acted on. I, 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 I hope it's going to be sooner rather than later because then kids can go to preschool, to daycare, to school. They don't have to worry about each other. They don't have to worry about, you know, the teachers. Don't have to, it's, it's, it, 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 it will get us even more close to normal again it, when, once that happens. Hopefully that'll happen over the summer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank you very much for you giving us your expertise and your time. This has been very informative, very, very important. A lot of questions on a lot of people's minds. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we uh, have lots more wonderful programming planned. Keep in touch and uh, have a wonderful night. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank